Hey, hello, and welcome to the Redneck Dentist. This is Doc Mike here on Real Liberty Media. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so another week has gone by. <clears throat> I am having an awesome day here in Oregon. Uh, it's just roughly about 80 degrees. It's dry, sunny, blue sky, a little breeze. Absolutely gorgeous. I uh, caught some other shows here on Real Liberty Media this week. Uh, can't, I probably won't catch everybody, but uh, Moose Girl and Grimner, of course, with Free Your Mind. That was an awesome show. Vinny did a great show last week, re- well worth listening to. Uh, Hal, also another great show. Anyway, you guys, if you're listening to me and you uh, like what you hear, be sure and check out some other shows on Real Liberty Media. Uh, what a week it has been, man. I think I even saw again this morning. Um, oh yeah, Vinny, I saw that joke. That is funny. <laughs> it is pretty funny. I'm not going to tell it, but it is funny. Um, I think I even saw today another, some kind of mass shooting or whatever. Uh, I don't know, but it sure seems to me there's a lot of that going on. We had a few this week again, you know, I got to go back and say, you know, where are my, you know, where are the rest of the people that should be carrying, concealed or open, legally carrying? I don't even care if you're illegal, illegally carrying, honestly. I think you have to do what you have to do to protect yourself in this world. And uh, while I encourage, you know, legal use, it seems to me the Second Amendment uh, gives us the right to carry firearms and defend ourselves. So I think you always have that to uh, go to. But, of course, the law doesn't always see it like that, unfortunately. But you know what? Here's the deal. I had a buddy, a hunting buddy. He passed in, like, 2005, I think. Yeah, maybe 2005 or six, something like that. His name was Don. And... Uh, uh, he always carried a handgun. He always had a handgun on him 100% of the time. And I kind of knew that because because he was a guy I chose to hang out with and we kind of had similar views of the world. We were hunting buddies, uh, ended up being hunting buddies. We actually met through a ham radio uh, gathering. And um, Don always carried a handgun and one day I finally asked, or I was talking about concealed carry permit, and I, and I said something about getting it or having got it or whatever, and he, I said, well, you have one, right? And he said, no, he said, I've never had one. I said, you've never had a concealed carry permit, and you carry all the time? And he goes, yeah. And I said, aren't you worried about getting caught and, you know, or you know, being searched or whatever, for whatever reason, he goes, no, just don't ever give him any reason to search. (laughs) But he, uh, you know, he was a guy who believed in protecting himself and others at, you know, whatever cost. And um, I'm not encouraging, (laughs) I'm not, I guess I am. I guess the bottom line is, yeah, I am. I think you need to do whatever you have to do to protect yourself. And I think it's going to get a lot worse. Um, You know, here we are. I know I don't speak for everybody, but I live in the country. And I live in Oregon, for those of you who don't know. And Portland is 60 miles away, 60-something miles away. And you see the violence there every single night. Uh, Of course, the violence has been increasing because they've you know, for whatever reasons, you know, because they've cut back on police, because there's more riots, because there's more people out uh, protesting their views on two sides of the aisle or whatever. And honestly, I, I can tell you the truth. I, I don't give a rat's ass. I really don't. I Portland, I, I went to school in Portland. That's where the dental school is here in Oregon. It's a school that I chose to go to after I went to the University of Oregon. I was born in Oregon, so, you know, I've been here most of my whole life, other than the time I spent in the service traveling the country. But 
I've always hated Portland, man. I I can't stand Portland. <laughs> and I I don't know why. I'm just not a big city guy. That's the bottom line. And uh, I came from a little logging town. Now it's more of a city, Springfield, Oregon, down kind of the middle part of the state on the west side. And it was a logging town, you know. So, I mean, we were even considered rednecks then, you know, and which was kind of funny because, you know, just being kids, I mean, your parents did whatever. But you were still kind of considered a redneck if you were from Springfield, which Springfield and Eugene are two towns that are, like, separated by a river. That's it, you know. Otherwise, they would blend together kind of like one big city. But, you know, the city folk, were from Eugene and the rednecks were from Springfield. Now, how that ever came about, I'll never know. <laughs> I don't know what the origin of that was, but if you were in Springfield, you know, you were country bumpkins, and if you were in Eugene, you were, you know, the city folk. So, why did I get off on that? I am, oh, yeah, because I hate Portland, because it's a big city, and I'm not a big city guy. I can't even. I, I, I can tell you, like, it, if anybody says to me, well, you have to go to Portland for this, that, or the other thing, oh, God, I just cringe at the idea of going to Portland. I don't like to drive the city streets. I don't like to park. I don't like to get out and walk. I don't like to interact with any city people. <laughs> that sounds really mean. and But it's kind of true. I just can't stand it. Unfortunately, there's some really good food in big cities, and it's food that I'm missing out on. And uh, you may not know this, but I really love food. In fact, when we're done here today, I'm going to grill up some chicken on the grill, and I can't remember what else we're having, but we're going to have some delicious food and uh, grilled outside. We grill all year long here. It doesn't matter. It could be rain, hail, sleet, snow, ice, you know, hot, 106. It, it doesn't matter what the weather is doing here. We grill. I mean, that's what we do. We love to grill. If we could grill 365, we would. We get kind of, I'm not going to say we get tired of grilling because I don't really think we do. But, um, you know, you got to have some other variety. So once in a while, you got to put a, you know, put a... Uh, uh, put a dish of chili together or some spaghetti or something like that that doesn't really uh, work very well on the grill, although you can do that kind of stuff on these new pellet grills. They're awesome. Um, never burn anything either. Uh, I love them. I just think it's the greatest way to cook. All right, well, let's get to it. Uh, thanks again, everybody. You guys are so awesome. Uh, I love the people in Real, Me Real Liberty Media chat too, by the way. If you get a chance, just click on the chat button if you're listening from Real Liberty Media. Or go find us on IRC, uh, easy to find, and just chat with the people there. Man, there's all kinds of characters there with great kind of information. By the way, since we're talking about that, last week I talked about Linux and Microsoft a bit. And oh my God, uh, Grimner, who actually did the show uh, Free Your Mind with Moose Girl, uh, he encouraged me, actually kind of recommended to me using Linux Mint, uh, the Cinnamon desktop, and I switched to that this week, and I am telling you, that is the smoothest operating system, beautiful operating system, very fast, very efficient, very easy to use. So if you want to get out from under Microsoft Windows and all their control, Boot yourself up a Linux partition on your Windows machine or even just get the um, disk image on a thumb drive and stick it in your uh, Windows machine and try it out and just see how nice it is to use that operating system. I'm really happy with it. So I was so happy with it that we spent about three and a half hours yesterday rearranging the computer station because it was just like, oh, I have a new, I have this new operating system and it looks so awesome. I'm going to just move my desk around. 
so I have a little different perspective of the world. So all I did was turn this, uh, it's an L-shaped glass computer station. So you kind of had to unload it to turn it 90 degrees. And of course, I disconnected everything, you know, so I could rerun the wires and kind of tidy them up so they look neat. Because good God, you know, it's kind of funny. In this wireless society, there's so many damn wires. It's crazy. But uh, anyway, I'm all kind of set up here. That's not true. I have the computer set up. I have kind of my notes going here. That's good. But other than that, uh, like, I, like I have a bunch of knickknacks and stuff that I need to put back on here and convenience things like a coaster for my drink. And uh, I have a, a cup full of pens that I set here, which is kind of funny because I only use one pen. It's just one of my things, kind of OCD thing. I just, I have one pen that I use. Actually, and I have one pen at work, and everybody knows not to touch my pen, and it's just a thing. It's not really that I'm a germaphobe, although pens are very dirty, I'll just say, especially public pens. I, I wouldn't touch a public pen unless you're trying to strengthen your immune system. But um, anyway, I have a, a cup holder with pens, and I have a coaster, and I have some some uh, chargers that I use to keep my phone charged or to recharge my phone when it goes, you know, gets starts getting low. But anyway, I got a little bit more work to do to set up the uh, workstation here. Time for a drink. Everybody drink up. All right. So I wanted to... Oh, I have to share this story with you first. Everybody knows by now that there's problems with the so-called vaccine. And of course, I've kind of wondered, probably since they started talking about, actually before they even started talking about vaccinating people, when they started talking about herd immunity and how many people were going to be infected and how many people were going to die and the whole kind of fear-mongering that went along with this ridiculous COVID-19 uh, disaster, so-called, that we've been going through. I've been thinking to myself, you know, it really doesn't matter. I mean, this was before they came up with a vaccine. I was thinking, it doesn't even matter if they come up with a vaccine because... There's so many people opposed to the vaccine or vaccines in general that you're never going to vaccinate everybody. Maybe if this virus had like a 90% mortality rate, maybe people would get vaccinated, but I really don't know. So today, excuse me. Yeah, that's the other thing that comes with uh beautiful weather and spring springing flowers uh trees blooming flowers blooming uh, a lot of allergens in the air so i have a ton but anyway um i was always i, I always knew it, it doesn't matter if they come up with a vaccine or not a vaccine is not going to be what uh what puts covid19 in check What's going to put COVID-19 in check is that a lot of people develop antibodies, and that means a lot of people need to be infected. Now, whether you get their so-called vaccine or whether you get COVID, either way, it seems to me you're going to develop antibodies. Here's the problem. You know, trying to do that artificially, well you kind of get artificial immunity, if you know what I mean. So they're going to take certain pieces of this virus and they're going to have your body replicate it so that, you know, your body knows how to make antibodies to it. But when you get the, the actual virus, your body's going to make antibodies to the virus or to many different parts of the virus. And you're going to have a greater possibility of having some immunity to any variants that to any variants that that um, 
virus can uh, can mutate to. So today, in it looks like in Texas, and this just came in my mail, so I don't know if you guys have this or not. It says a fully vaccinated person dies of COVID-19 in Texas, officials say. Now, I haven't even read the article yet, and I'm probably not going to... to to, uh, I'm probably not going to take time to read it right now because I want to make sure I get through at least, you know, I don't know, 70 or 80 percent of the other stuff I have to talk about today. But here's a problem is if this vaccine was or any of the so-called vaccines were actually effective then we wouldn't need to remain locked down. We wouldn't need to continue social distancing. We wouldn't need to continue wearing masks. You would be basically bulletproof. But that's not the case. I mean, here's somebody fully vaccinated, died. And I mean, there's been, I, and I don't even have a complete list. Um and that's absolutely right. Grimner says uh, the thing that will put COVID-19 as check is when, in, is when people stop believing in authority. Boy, do I have some things to say about that. I wanted to go over. So in Georgia, the J&J &J vaccine, they had problems with it. In Colorado, J&J &J vaccine, they had problems with it. Um, Merck vaccine failed. Um, North Carolina had adverse, re had adverse reactions. There was improper handling of the vaccine uh, in some places. Oh, and this is really important, everybody, and I'm going to put this link in my show notes, and I really encourage you to go um, check it out because it's. Imp I, I think it's important, and these people actually asked, I mean, this person actually asked to spread this story, and it's called Maddie's Story. And this is about um, a young girl. Be, uh, they started testing, uh, Moderna started testing on children, and this one little girl, 10 or 12 years old, she has had multiple problems since she got the vaccine, actually become became paralyzed from the waist down, and I think she's having, so she has some uh, issues with her digestive system and she's having a hard time you know getting nutrition and anyway there's problems there's problems with their vaccines we all know that the problem started from the very beginning when we tried to manage this vaccine by keeping people away from each other and I can't believe that that most of the world so easily just got on board with this. And I was thinking earlier, I was thinking about some of, let's just take baseball, for example. I was thinking if any of these sports who, I assume these sports bring in tons of money. Otherwise, I don't know how they would continue to exist. I mean, some of these baseball, football, basketball players are making multi-millions of dollars. Yes, a lot of them don't. You know, a lot of them get some standard pay for being a standard player. But, you know, the stars of these different sports um, get paid tons of money. So I was thinking to myself, you know, why did, especially baseball, and I guess baseball because I consider baseball America's sport. Like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't even care if you like baseball or don't like baseball. Uh, I personally love to go to live sporting events. I almost never do. Maybe once every five years I'll get to go to a live sporting event. And man, I love it. I love everything about it. I love sitting in the stadium. I love eating stadium food. I love cheering and booing and just the whole atmosphere is is awesome. And I was thinking, why didn't any of these sports, especially baseball, America's sport, supposedly, why didn't they resist this whole thing? I mean, so when COVID 
first started, it was like in, well, I mean, not first started. When we first started doing all of this lockdown, social distancing, masking stuff, baseball was just getting started. That was in March of 2020. And everybody buckled to it so much. And what kind of scares me about it, and, and I've said this before, you know, a lot of people in the country think that the people who work for the federal government are somehow really special or really talented or really the cream of the crop people, but that's not true. They're not. Usually, they're pretty much average, you know, performers who choose to have a government job because of, oh, you know, several factors. One, you know, the job's always pretty damn easy. Um, your performance really, you know, as long as you just hang in there, you're going to continue to get raises. You're going to continue to get benefits. You're going to get continue to get increases in pay. Um, it's a pretty dang easy job, really, with, with really good benefits. Uh, and that's why people go work for the federal government. I, I can pretty much assure you, even though I don't know personally people who would make this choice, but if you're at the top of the class at Brown, Harvard, Yale, uh, um, Stanford, uh, you know, any of these great schools in the nation, if you're kind of at the top, you're not going to turn around and go, hey, uh, I think I'll go work for the federal government. No, you're not going to do that because there's going to be headhunters looking for you to come and work for their corporations for a ton more money than you're going to make with the federal government. And you're probably going to get more grant money. You're going to get more, um, I was going to say respect, but I don't really mean that. You're going to get more opportunities to publish work that is actually valuable. Anyway, my point is, so the people who are in federal government who and state governments who are making all these decisions are morons. They're average people who have taken government jobs. And here they are pu putting a stop to, you know, society in basically they're putting a stop to everything you can't go you can't go shopping you have limited numbers of people in restaurants you know and you can't go to places where you might uh, you know participate in some activity like bowling or just playing pool or going to the, the outdoor pools public pools whatever you know everything brought to a halt and it really kind of pissed me off that baseball didn't do something about it because I was thinking, let's just take for an example. Um, my wife is from Wisconsin and her mom was from Wisconsin. So we follow Wisconsin teams. We follow the Green Bay Packers. We follow the Milwaukee Bucks. We follow the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, so, Let's just take the Milwaukee Brewers. Let's say their their ballpark holds 36,000, I don't know what it is. Let's say 40,000 people. Let's say that, you know, when Fauci originally said, you know, um, you know, we have to have this isolation, we have to do the social distancing, you know, we're, we're going to lock down the country. And in the individual states, governors made the same uh, overreach. Well, you know what if baseball would have just said, "No, we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to do that. We're going to go ahead and have our games. We're going to go ahead and fill our stadiums. We're going to go ahead and conduct conduct business as usual." You know, and what if it was left up to you as an individual to decide whether or not going to that game on that day was the right thing for you to do? And that's, I guess that's where I am with this whole decision-making thing. 
you should be in charge of making that decision yourself. If you have underlying health conditions, if you're over 75 years old, you should consider maybe avoiding places where you might get exposed to this flu bug. Because it's kind of up to you to take care. It is up to you to take care of yourself. You know, here's one of my problems. I get so easily distracted about things I'm thinking about. Because I just wanted to say this, and then I'll get back to the my ballpark analogy. I don't know how long it's been since we started giving trophies for participating, but that's what I feel like has happened, is that society has become used to getting some kind of a pat on the back for doing nothing or for not excelling or for not taking care of themselves and for not taking responsibility for their own actions or their own health. Oh, well, here's a trophy because you showed up. Okay, well, great. But, you know, did you learn anything from that? Did you improve your technique, your skills, anything, you know, did it help you in any way to just show up and get a trophy? No, I don't think so. But it made you feel good, I'll bet, I guess. But here we are, however many years later. I And I, like I said, I can't even remember when that started happening. I think because when it started happening, I was like, well, this is stupid. <laughs> Nobody's going to do this. Oh, guess what? Yeah, everybody's going to do it. So back to my baseball analogy here. So let's say 40,000 people showed up in April of last year and attended, you know, the first Brewers home game opener. And let's say that in those 40,000 people, there were some people that were infected with COVID. And let's just say that those people were the average human being in the United States or the average human being is in Wisconsin right now. You know, 30, 40, 50 years old. They might be a little overweight. They might smoke. They might drink. Yeah, they might have some kind of underlying health condition. You know, but maybe... Let's say if it doesn't affect your lungs, I probably wouldn't worry about it. If it doesn't affect if your heart isn't, you know, extremely weak, you would probably go to this game. You might or might not get infected. Yes, it may be one of those spreader events that causes lots of people to get infected. My point would be that is exactly what we need to have happen. We're not going to accomplish this with vaccines. I'm pretty certain 50% of the country is anti-vax people. I can tell you, even though I've had the damn vaccine, the Moderna jab, I'm not getting any more. They say now you're going to need a third one, and you're probably going to need one every year. Well, guess what? I, we're, I'm done with it. We're So many people are not going to get it, and we're certainly not going, I'm not going to continue to do this. I don't know what their plan is. I've said before, you know, you can look at this conspiracy thing both ways. You can either say, hey, they're giving you the shot so they can wipe out, you know, however many people get the shot, or they're giving the shot to the people that they're going to save and everybody else is going to die. I really don't know. If you want my honest opinion, I think China's probably not done with us and releasing back, uh, viruses. Uh, I do believe this was biological warfare, you know, put in honest terms, biological warfare. And I don't think it's over with. I think it's going to continue. I think there's something else coming at us. I mean, maybe not right away, but I mean, they've already seen how easy it was to get uh, everybody, number one, scared, I guess, and reacting ridiculously. Um, so I think something else will be coming. Uh, and it may have a much higher 
uh, mortality rate. It, it probably will. I mean, if they had, if they really were trying to destroy human beings to kill human beings, you can pretty much bet they're going to alter some virus so that it's extremely deadly and it will come and wipe out however many people very rapidly. What's kind of interesting, I guess, as far as uh, our reaction to this spread of this virus is um, we really didn't do a very good job of keeping the virus out of this country. And, of course, now we're doing an even worse job because we have wide open the southern border. Well, probably northern border, too. It's really not just the southern border, but any border. And, um, I mean, look at the conditions that those people are living in. They're living in extremely crowded conditions. You know, 100%, you know the truth is they're not, somebody in there is infected and um, with COVID, and they're spreading it. And then they're just being released into the country. So we're not doing a very good job of controlling it. So if China, if China wanted to, and it really doesn't need to be China. It could be anybody, but right now it's China. If they really wanted to wipe out the U.S. population, you know, and come and take over the country themselves, which I think they probably have a pretty good chance of doing now anyway, um, yeah, they would release a virus with a much higher mortality rate, and they can see it's going to spread, and they can see that we're not going to be able to contain it because we're afraid to do the right thing. We're afraid to lock down the borders, you know, which is what I think we sort of did in the beginning, but we didn't do a good enough job. Um, anyway, uh, I wanted to talk about this whole idea of, chi of China or any other country trying to take over the United States, because this is kind of an interesting concept. At least I had an interesting thought about this uh, in the last week. You know, I think of stuff all week long, and then I think, I wonder if this would be a good topic or not. And I, I don't know how many of you guys do shows who, if you think, you know, is this going to be a good topic or not? And I think about it for a while, and then I go, ah, who knows? you got to put it out there and let other people decide. So I was thinking, uh, you know, since World War One and World War Two, I think a lot of the world, and especially here in the United States, I think people think that warring is over. And I think that people think that other countries are satisfied with where they are and what they have. In other words, I think most people think that other countries aren't interested in expanding their reach any further than it already is. But I can tell you, there's nothing further from the truth. For the entire history of civilization, man has wanted more. You know, more than what they had. I mean, their whole idea was to go out and conquer the world. You know, to take over. And, I mean, it's, it's not just one culture. I mean, it's every single culture in the world has tried to expand their territory. Um, some of those cultures didn't actually claim ownership to the land that they lived on, but many of them did, and, you know, it wasn't uh, long before that kind of, uh, and with air quotes I'll say, civilization kicked in where, you know, any land you occupied was therefore your land. But uh, I just don't think that countries are satisfied with what they have. And I think it comes down to the people that run those countries, the people that are elected. You know, it's kind of hard to have a country without some elected officials. But the problem is, as soon as you have elected officials who somehow are going to represent the people, again, some air quotes, well, they're really not going to be representing the people. They're going to do what they think is best. And, of course, 
ultimate power corrupts ultimately, so they're going to continue to expand their kingdom, their universe, their properties, their political reach as far as they can, as long as it continues to be beneficial to them. In other words, if they take over additional properties, additional peoples, well, they can collect taxes from them, or they can use their resources. And I think, you know, some, I have a hard time believing, not completely impossible, but I have a hard time believing that there's a global elite that wants to take over the world. And here's why I have a problem with that. Is because each faction of that global elite has got to be thinking to themselves, as soon as we accomplish this, I'm going to destroy that person. I'm going to destroy that person. I'm going to position myself so that this is all mine. I mean, can you imagine if your goal, if your idea, philosophy is to subjugate the entire rest of the world to you and your buddy's wishes, why would it stop there? <laughs> I mean... It's only a matter of time before that's just not going to be enough and you want some of your buddy's share or you want your buddy out of the way so that you have more so that you have more or you can you know you have more power, you have more money, you have more uh resources or you have the better resources or you have more pull over you know whatever those people do, I don't even know. I do know they exist. I'm not saying that that global elite doesn't exist and that they don't have meetings, uh, Bilderbergs or whoever, Bilderbergs, um, what's that other society called? And uh, It doesn't matter. Uh, I believe that they exist. I just, I just have a hard time believing that it's just going to stop when they think they've dominated the world. And I really don't think that they're that far away from accomplishing you know, that task, even though I have a really hard time believing that they could actually, that that's actually their goal. And I've heard that it is, you know, I've heard that they want to destroy, what, 80% of the population on the earth because there's just too many of us. So, um, man, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, but so I know that they exist. Um, and I really don't believe that they're going to be happy when they get when they get to where they think they ought to be. And if you look at some of these other countries like China and Russia, you know, the biggest countries, I think, in the world, man, if you could control the entire world, you know, so that nobody else is a pain in your ass, like, you know, we tend to be a pain in China's ass when we, you know, create issues with them if we sanction them and, you know, they're trying to be the... Uh, global uh, currency now um, they're trying to establish themselves as the global power and they may very well do it so you know any resistance we give to them you know it's it's kind of a pain in their ass so of course if they could somehow get us under control one way or the other either by eliminating us physically or dominating us uh, destroying our economy or uh, cutting us off from the rest of the world. I mean, why wouldn't they do that if it expands their reach and their power and their resources? Sure, they'd be looking for it. I mean, why do they buy up so much of our properties and our debt here in this country if they're not planning on eventually owning it? <laughs> so there's got to be a reason Uh and it's not just China. I could imagine Russia being in a position to do the same thing. And, oh, my God, Joe Biden had me scared to, not even scared to death. I don't even care. Like I said, I live in the country. Eventually, I guess when they get to me, 
that'll pretty much be the end one way or the other, but uh, I'm sure all the big cities would be wiped out first. But good God, that guy is an idiot, just a flippin' moron challenging Russia. <laughs> he doesn't he he is not the guy in position to do any kind of battle with with Vladimir. I mean, number one, Vladimir's way smarter than Joe Biden, way more alert than Joe Biden, in much better shape than Joe Biden. You know, just like all in all, a hundred percent, you know, better than Joe Biden on all fronts. Biden shouldn't even be talking in the direction of Vladimir because he he just doesn't have the he doesn't have the tools to do any kind of uh, um, mental or physical challenges there. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I guess it's fun to watch. All right, so where in the hell did I leave off? Okay, oh, the one thing I was, I wanted to get back to the baseball analogy. So here's the, like, the bottom line for me is, if Major League Baseball would have done that, we would have seen a lot more people infected. We would have seen a lot more people develop immunity. And maybe, yeah, some people might have died. 0.18% of all people who get infected with the virus die. And I forget what percent, 90%, 95% of those people are over 75. So like I said, take care of yourself. Make your own decision. But no. Major League Baseball just kowtowed, you know, and uh, followed the recommendations of Fauci and the governor of his state or governor of their state. And in, instead of us progressing on this, you know, war against COVID, no, we're stagnant here. What we need to do, even, uh, and I think in a couple of weeks ago, I might even post it in my show notes, but maybe not. But there was actually a study that said this isolation and wearing masks is only going to delay the peak that we're going to have anyway. So if we're going to have that peak anyway, let's do it. Let's let healthy people get infected, mostly survive, and let's get that herd immunity going as naturally as possible. That makes the most sense to me. It's going to be the quickest way. We probably would have been done with this by now if one year ago, we would have, as soon as we figured out who was the most vulnerable, if we would have said, okay, everybody else, go back to life, man. You start getting sick, go home. You know, relax, recover, take care of yourself. You'll probably survive. Instead, we had all that horrific fear-mongering I even have pictures of the first. So I was I was uh, I was not working from March uh, till June, and I was following the headlines, man. I was looking at all this stuff, trying to make sense of it all, trying to find some alternative sources, trying to find original sources for this information. I saw the freaking refrigerator trucks in the parking lots of hospitals. I saw them saying the bodies were piling up and they didn't have room for them, so they were just stacking them up in a hospital room or in the morgue or in a basement or in a parking lot. I saw them ordering up the refrigerator trucks. I saw, you know, in uh, New York uh, City or somewhere in New York State, um, they had uh, they they just had trucks and body bags and extra body bags ordered up. And, yeah, the fear was real. I mean, the fear that they put in the people was real. The actual disease fear, the, the actual fear that the disease should have caused was not real. There could have been a much more practical approach to this disease. Yeah, maybe, maybe three weeks 
you know, till we get a handle on some data, maybe three weeks, you know, let's all be careful, let's just take it easy. But holy hell, it was like, well, after that three weeks, you know, that worked so well getting everybody to just do what we want them to do. We're just going to keep it going. And so they have kept it going here over a year later. Oh, and it's disappointing. You know, NFL did the same thing, or I should say didn't do the same thing. You know, the entire world didn't do the same thing, and especially the United States. We didn't do the thing that we should do as America, as Americans, as individuals, as people who should be responsible for our own health and well-being, our own financial futures, our own physical futures. We should have been the ones to make the decision whether we wanted to go out and be exposed to COVID or not. And I mean, luckily, you know, I'm in the company of people who who make that decision. A lot of people at Real Liberty Media are are practical thinkers, and they know what they need to do to take care of themselves. The problem is, you know, so we've done so much to make people reliant on government. In one way or another, I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go off track here a minute because I've actually worked. So, you guys know I was in the public health service for 20 years, roughly. I was in the public health service for 20 years. So, public health service is basically socialized medicine, socialized dentistry. And whenever I would hear people, and for, I'm 63, so for a lot, a huge part of my life, I've heard people talk about socialized medicine. And let me tell you, being the person who dispenses socialized medicine, I speak from experience when I say, if you're part of a socialized medical system, guess what? You don't get everything. They don't cover everything. They have a set of uh, they have a set of procedures that they will cover. Right? And you have to meet the criteria to get those procedures covered. So let's say you're missing, I'm going to use dental examples. Let's say, let's say you're 30 years old, you're a male, and you have beautiful teeth mostly. You had braces when you were 16, 17, 18, so you have beautiful straight teeth. Now you're on your own, you know, you haven't, had a great job or had intermittent employment or whatever, and you're on the state's uh, medical plan. And you go to the dentist because last night you were eating popcorn, watching a movie, and you broke a cusp off one of your molars. Okay, so you go in and see your your doc who actually takes whatever health plan you have, And you go, look, Doc, I broke my tooth. And Doc looks at it. Yeah, you did break your tooth. So, you know, the Doc, who probably also sees other patients, private pay and other insurance patients, he says, yep. He says, you know what? The best thing that you can do for that tooth is put a crown on it. And the patient says, okay, uh, how much much is this crown? Or mostly this is what they say. Hey, um... Does my insurance cover that? And the doc looks at him like, oh, I don't know. I don't do insurance. You'll have to talk to the front. So guy gets up to the front or, you know, more than likely the assistant goes, hey, I'm going to check on that insurance for you. We'll get an answer for you pretty quick. They go up to the front and they check his insurance and it's a state medical plan. 
And he comes, they, they come back and go, yeah, the state medical plan doesn't cover a crown. That would be an out-of-pocket expense to you. It's going to be $2,000 or $1,000. And the guy's like, yeah, well, you know, I'm not working right now. That's why I'm on the state plan. If I broke my tooth, I need it fixed. And the doc goes, oh, okay, well, you know, yeah, we can put a filling in there. It'll be kind of a temporary fix until you can get a crown, but... You know, it should hold you for a while because that's what the insurance will pay for. They'll pay for the tooth to be fixed. More than likely, they'll pay for it to be extracted. And you can bet that if you take an x-ray of that tooth and you see the fracture and it goes, if it's anywhere close to the pulp, the insurance company is not going to recommend that you get a filling. They're going to say, hey, take that tooth out. That's what we'll cover because it looks like in the future it's going to need a root canal. It's going to need a crown. We might as well just get rid of it now. So that's socialized medicine or dentistry. You don't get everything that you think that you're going to get. You know, I think that's what people think is when they when you talk about socialized medicine, you're like, oh, I'm going to get a new heart or I'm going to get new lungs or I'm going to get a knee replacement or this, that, or the other thing. Well, you might get some of those things if you meet the very stringent criteria. You might get some of those things. And you probably be waiting a long time to get them because that is the other thing about those systems is the demand is extremely high and the ability to provide the supply is extremely low. Because like a lot of my colleagues, they, they number one, they have huge debt to pay off. I hear these days that a graduate from dental school is coming out of school with a half a million do- a half a million dollars debt, five hundred thousand dollars and greater in debt. And I can tell you for a fact that what they pay a dentist today, and this is kind of a whole long story, I'd have to go into ex- to explain it. Like a dentist could start his own practice and good luck with that because you're going to, I mean, if you start fresh, brand new from the dirt up, you're going to be in debt even more, hundreds of thousands or maybe a million dollars or more. And then getting people to come in your door versus all the other dental clinics that are out there that have been open for years and all the dental service organizations who have corporate offices in every single state and every single big city in all the little strip malls or near them so that you can get quick access when you're on your way to go shopping or whatever. you got a lot of competition to go to. Those dentists aren't going to take the state's health insurance plan because it doesn't pay them enough. So, um, so the support so, so the ability to provide that care is extremely limited. So, but it's interesting, you know, my sister, I, I got to tell you, honestly, this is awesome. My sister is an extreme liberal, like really extreme liberal, like blinders on will not listen to any kind of reason. Um, But she's always touted socialized medicine. And, you know, when we do have those discussions, you know, it I mean, it's like talking to a brick wall because to her it makes perfect sense. And to me, from my side, and I got to tell you, I'm not the greatest dentist in the world. I'm a good dentist. I mean, I have 40 years of experience now. Oh, my God, that's a long time. I'm 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 a pretty good dentist. I can probably rebuild a tooth that most people wouldn't even think of rebuilding. And I don't mean with a crown. I mean with materials, you know, that we use this to, in these days to replace tooth structure and to make it work for some time because I want people to keep their function. I want them to keep their smile and I know when I take that tooth out, they're going to be stuck with something that is absolutely way less functional and way less aesthetic than what than what they had and what they were born with. So, 
You know, and and plus, when I was in the public health service, I mean, to save some teeth, you had to be creative. You weren't going to do crowns on them. You had to do some fillings. And you had to do some pretty damn big fillings on some people. So, so I'm just saying, I mean, I can, you know, but there's going to be a lot of guys out there that just can't do that, just don't want to do that. They don't want to take the time. They're not gifted in that. They don't have that skill set. They haven't been forced into providing that kind of care. But, you know, that's, that's I guess, kind of part of being the redneck dentist is living in the country, helping country folks out, my neighborhood, my people. You know, I see these people when I go to town. I live in a town, well, the, it says the population is about 5,000, but 2,500 of them are federal inmates. So guess what? I live in a town where there's 2,500 people. You think I don't see those people when I'm out on my tractor heading downtown to, you know, I fix a help fix the uh, coffee shop's parking lot, spread some gravel for them one day. Um, you know, or I'm shopping in town, or I go to the mercantile for chicken feed or straw. or whatever. I see these people, like you know, and I, I have to... I want them to know that I did everything I could to help them out. But that's just not going to be the case with everybody who is involved in socialized medicine. Everybody who has to be part of those systems, you know, unfortunately, you're just not going to get the... I'm not saying the care isn't great. You are going to get great care, but you're not getting the top-tier care. You're not going to get the highest-level care. And you know what? I know for a fact. I have people come in my office all the time. I see them. You know, farmers who have done well in this community, who have done well in this area. They're driving that nice, beautiful F-350 dually. Looks like it's two years old. I know he's doing well. He comes in to see me. Hey, your tooth needs to be fixed. you got to get a crown on that tooth. It's already cracked two times. You know, we fixed it. Nah, Doc, just take it out. <laughs> because it's like 80 bucks to take it out versus, uh, you know, I don't know, $1,200 for a root canal, $1,000 for a crown. That dude's he's like, ah, take it out. Don't need it. You know, and I have other people who are more than willing to uh, spend the money to get their tooth fixed. Okay, so that's going to about do it for me. Hey, I just want to tell you, this is like funny as hell. I, <laughs> I have three pages of notes that I thought I'd get to today. We made it through almost one. And you'll see in the show notes, it's not even that. <laughs> it's, it's not even, um, it is not even that much uh, to talk about. But man, I just get so sidetracked, I guess, sometimes talking about stuff. Hopefully it wasn't boring. Anyway, hey, catch us on Real Liberty Media. You can catch me, Doc Mike, Redneck Dentist. You can see... Um, Free Your Mind, uh, American Dissonance um, House Show. I forget what that's called. I'm sorry, I forgot, and I'm not looking at it right now. Um, but uh, you guys are awesome. Thank you. I hope I see you again next week. It's been fun, and we are done.